Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to Ed Up on the Ed Up Experience podcast, where we make education your business. We are still, I say still because now we're in our second or third day of recording live here in Doha, Qatar, at the World Innovation Summit for Education. Um, I cannot believe I'm here. I'm, I'm still kind of fuzzy on time. Uh, my wife and kids woke up this morning. I was going to bed, so I'm all reversed and jumbled up, but... I am meeting with some amazing people, and I have, yes, I do, have another amazing person here in front of me. Um, she's an award winner, and I'm going to ask her what award she won. Uh, you wouldn't believe it if I told you, but she's going to tell you. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. She's CEO of Teach for All, Wendy Cop. Wendy, how are you? I'm good. Um, first of all, congratulations on the incredible award that you won. Tell our audience about it. Thank you so much. Um... Well, we were recognized with the Wise Prize for Education, um, which is an incredible tribute to the whole Teach for All community. So what is Teach for All? Give us a quick, uh, set the stage for us, quick overview. Um, what is Teach for All? What is the scope? What do you do? How do you do it? We are a global network of independent, locally led organizations in 61 countries and growing around the world who are all brought together by a common purpose, which is to develop collective leadership to ensure all children fulfill their potential. Um, so each of the network organizations inspire their country's diverse and promising leaders to put their energy into initially teaching for at least two years in marginalized communities and, and ultimately working for the rest of their lives to transform the systems around kids and ensure that they have the chance to actually develop as leaders who can shape a better future. You know, that's, this is a really interesting time to talk about teachers and um, I, as somebody who has kids and appreciates teachers more than I ever have before, especially as I had kids that were that had uh, were in remote learning, I have to remember that there are kids that can't even access learning, that, that don't even don't have internet, don't have food, and and you look at all the things around a, a kid in underdeveloped nations, or they just can't access education. Do people still want to be teachers? Uh, it's just kind of you look at how low they're paid. I feel like appreciation is not there. Maybe it's coming a little bit now, but I mean, is it a lost? I mean, they're, they're, universities in the United States are dying to get hmm. teachers in their pipeline. I think that now it, it's never been more clear to me that this is the, the path of no regrets for the rising generation of young people to say, you know what? I mean, one thing I've learned over time in this work is that there is no path to any of our global aspirations for sustainability, equity and justice, peace, without ensuring that today's students are developing as leaders with the agency, the awareness, the problem-solving skills, critical thinking skills, the empathy, the sense of well-being they will need to navigate this world and shape a better future. And... I cannot imagine a more fulfilling and important pursuit for the most thoughtful and determined and innovative young leaders out there than to say, you know what, we're going to make this our, our thing. We need to channel our energy into transforming our education systems. What yeah. needs to be transformed? Give me uh, your, your thought process on where the transformation needs to be. Is it technology? Is it access? Is it... Um, is it all of the above? I mean, give me your, because you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. So. I mean, what brought me and many people across our network to this was initially just the recognition that our system is deeply inequitable. So that's one thing that needs to change. I mean, where you're born predicts the educational opportunity you have and the outcomes you have in your life, essentially. Yikes! Yes. Um, I think as we've progressed, what I've realized is we need to do more than simply catch kids up in, in a system that is honestly fundamentally broken. I think we need to reorient the whole system towards a different purpose. Um, and that's really what we're working to do across our network. And it's what I think all those young adults out there who are searching for how they're going to live a life of meaning should channel their energy towards. I mean, our system was built decades and decades ago when the world was different. Mm -hmm. And we need to reorient um, in a way that is relevant and important in today's world, given today's challenges, today's opportunities. 
you, um, everything that you just said, put it right before COVID and it has tremendous relevance. And then yes. you had COVID on top of it. How did that change your mission, your resources, your focus, if at all? I think you're absolutely right, first of all. But I think what, what this COVID era has done, I mean, first of all, it has compounded the challenges facing the most marginalized kids in the world who are least likely to be safe and even have access to food and healthcare, et cetera, but, but who certainly also had the least access to ongoing learning. Um, at the same time, though, it, it has also I think generated new possibilities. I mean, this system was already broken, as you said, like right. already the most marginalized kids in the world were not getting the kind of education they needed. So the good news is that I think this pandemic era has first of all shown the light on the inequity. Um, it's led us all to recognize, I, I think it's actually increased, elevated the, the kind of discussion around the importance of education and it's also, you know, we've stepped out of the box of a system that wasn't working for us. And what we've seen across our network and beyond is new educational practices and mindsets that actually, you know, if we could sustain and spread them, could speed up progress towards a world that was actually developing students' leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I think has changed. I think we actually have more possibility now to transform the system. Have you gotten frustrated you know, so again, take what you said before, put it pre-COVID. Was there frustration that the system isn't changing? Because you're putting tremendous time, effort, years, blood, sweat, tears into this passion of yours, global passion. Do you get frustrated? And did COVID, as, as horrible as it was um, and, and continues to be, did it, to your point, is it, do you sit down and go, okay, wait a second. Now everybody's seeing what I'm seeing. So maybe there's opportunity in the disruption. And and now you kind of, you know, twist the knife, so to speak. Um, I know this sounds ter terrible. That, that's a terrible analogy, but you know what I mean? I think um, really pre-pandemic, post-pandemic and always, I don't spend too much time in, in the land of frustration, mostly because I have this incredible privilege of seeing every day evidence in classrooms, whole yeah. schools, whole communities, that something different is possible. And that because with you're seeing it happen on daily yes, basis. Yes. And I'm seeing that with enough leadership, you know, from students, from teachers, from parents, from and caregivers, from people around the whole system, policymakers, civic leaders, we can have something very different. And so I see that I saw it before the pandemic and I continue to see it. And I do think, as you say, we have a lot to work with right now and I hope we won't. And at the same time, I, I don't want to skim over the fact that we also have a tremendous challenge on our hands with this current generation of young people, particularly those in the least resourced communities. You talk about leadership and its importance in the ecosystem of teaching and learning and Brit, what, what, are today's leaders missing? I mean, because we, we put out higher education, I say we, because I've worked in it for 20 years. We put graduates out into the world and those companies we put them in and the institutions that the students go into, the employers come back and they say, you know what? They're missing practical skills or they're missing the soft skills or power skills, whatever you want to say, to be these global leaders. So go back and reform your curriculum. How often do you talk with higher ed institutions or with with those that are training teachers and saying, you know what, this is what is happening out here in the real world. Maybe you need more access and diversity training. Are you an advisor and are you providing that advisory capacity or are the graduates coming out and it's just about passion more than it's about anything else? I think what we've spent a lot of energy thinking about over these last few years is just how much all the adults in the system will need to unlearn a set of mindsets that we learned in our own education mm -hmm. system if we're going to provide kids the kind of education they need. And I think that's true. It's certainly true in our work in kind of pre-K to 12, and I'm guessing it's also true in higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've, in fact, at the moment, we're working to develop a new teacher development framework and approach that is starts with mindsets and, you know, we've seen that everything is different when students, or excuse me, when teachers see their students as whole people with the potential for leadership, 
which when they see themselves as learners rather than the people with all the answers stage on the stage yeah, yeah. when they see the, the communities around kids as as you know having power and strengths and assets and when they understand that the challenges we see pop up all the time in our classrooms and communities are systemic they're not innate to people they're they're caused by the systemic challenge and need to be tackled at their root. So when all those are true, teachers operate differently yeah. and, and they do foster their students. You know, they build relationships with their students. They foster their development as, as whole people. They build their sense of awareness of the world and of, of their own strengths and purposes. They build their sense of well-being and empathy for others. And, and ultimately, I think we'll have just a very different a different future because we'll have people who are developed differently. Wow. Wow. I love, I, I love when you go into the, the depth of answer because it brings up so many more questions. One being in what you're talking about is ultimately cultural competence. And, and that is, I don't know, it's like a lost art that we talk about in higher education all the time. We, we forget how to talk to people who have differences in us and we forget how to honor the background and we're trying to force people into a box. That's one of the fundamental uh, uh, aspects that separates a teacher from a good teacher, an amazing teacher, is your ability to look around the culture that you're teaching in and use the surroundings in the curriculum and in the lessons because the students are more engaged, right? I mean, that's how yes. you, that is how you develop leadership in those areas. Absolutely. And teaching in ways that are affirming of the identities and histories of the students we're working with um, and that that develop students abilities to work across lines of difference and to collaborate with each other you know imagine how different the world would be if if all kids were developed in that way I and mean, would we have the same level of polarization that is pervading the world at the moment where are you based do you be New based York City. in New York City? And how often do you travel and get out? <laughs> Pre-pandemic? Yes. Pre-pandemic, I was never in New York. You know, I mean, I was traveling four or five days a week yes. and had just such an incredible privilege of visiting all these incredible, you know, teachers and, and team members across the world. Um, but yeah, life has been very different over the last couple of years. Are you itching? Are you itching to get out and visit? Or has the pandemic changed you and the way you'll operate in the future? I think it's definitely changed. I mean, we've we had built our whole network on Zoom. I mean, we of were course. already doing so much yeah. virtually, but we've learned still more about what is possible virtually. And I do think that that will hopefully help us be all the more deeply interconnected as we go forth. Um, but it's also true that there's no substitute for being in people's communities and countries and, and, and really building kind of in-person relationships. So. Can you give me one example for our audience of something that just you remember from all the places that you visited, the teachers, the kids that just sticks with you or has stuck with you over the years? You know, there are so many examples, so I'm going to use the most recent of them, which was last night we had such an incredible discussion with the Teach for Qatar teachers, alumni, team members. I It was by far, it was the best two hours of my week. They went around the circle and talked about, well, they introduced themselves and talked about their Teach for Qatar experience, and each and every one of them spoke so deeply to the relationships they built with their students. One of the one of the teaching fellows said, honestly, I'm a different person today and my students are a part of me. Mm. And each of them spoke to the fact that they will never leave the work and that they are going to radically improve the public education system in Qatar. And they they talked about how they were going to do that and how they were going to work together across the whole system and who was going to one day become the minister and and who was going to wow. still be teaching you know it, anyway it, it's it was such an affirmation of this work of ours I, I feel like i just see the same movie playing from community to community to country to country there's just something so transformative about these organizations and the time the 
teaching fellows spend with their kids and how that transforms them and how it ultimately generates kind of a critical mass of leaders who work together to change the whole system. Yeah, you must have breathed a little easier after that conversation to know that the impact that you're having is is going to make a difference. Um, I mean, that is, I'm sure, why you do the work that you do. Um, what would you like to say about Teach for All as a CEO? Anything at all that uh, the organization, something I forgot to ask you, something you have going on, anything? We are, you know, working across Teach for All to meet this moment that has compounded the challenges facing students and, as we've discussed, has generated new possibilities. I think part of that means we need still more of the most determined and and innovative and creative young adults to channel their energy towards this work. And, and I think I would just leave on that note. Um, I just cannot imagine anything more important and more fulfilling than working alongside many others in, in the most marginalized communities in the world towards transforming the systems around kids who have the potential to remake the world. Well, that's a call for teachers if I ever heard one. Ladies and gentlemen, she's the CEO of Teach For All. Wendy Kopp, thank you for coming and stopping by. You've Thanks done an incredible so job. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just add up.